Okay, so lessons 26 and 27 were articles from a magazine in France at liberation.fr, which had many reports, four articles worth of reading here, the last two and the next two, on what was going on in Argentina after the crash. What were people doing to survive? And how were they coping? Now, all they report is good news. The good news of how bartering, they call it, trading, they call it, is really made efficient by use of their own community interest-free currency. Now, during that time as well, some of the provinces had issued their own small denomination provincial bonds, which is a really good way of getting interest-free currency into circulation. Now, You've got the provinces dumping a lot of interest-free currency into circulation. You've got all these credito systems dumping a lot of currency into circulation. And yet, inflation didn't go up. Now, I explained why back in the 1980s, when these provinces put a lot of provincial bond currency into circulation, and the bankers bemoaned it was going to cause inflation, more money chasing the goods, that inflation actually went down from a thousand percent to 36 percent a year. It went down if you expect inflation shift B, which is not more money chasing the goods, but the same money chasing less goods after seizure, after foreclosure. And what's going on here? Too much foreclosure or too much money? Well, it's too much foreclosure. It was proven in Argentina. They're doing it again. So, you've got all these different sources of interest-free currencies going into circulation, and watch what's going to happen. So, with a credito or an ardoise, they say it's impossible to play the stock market or practice usury. This money would thus be able to conserve the advantages of money with respect to barter, notably different purchases over time, while all avoiding the buffeting of finance and speculation. How true! If everybody can borrow from the bank interest free, who's going to borrow from someone else or need someone else's money? New world, right? Very often, its promoters also insist on the social bond and the local dimensions, far more than just the economic aspect. A position boiling down to the bond is as important as the product, posted at the City Day site. And I, when I did my tour in France, I kept talking to these people who had these pretty good little lifeboats, you know? And they kept thinking, gee, if we connect to the outside world, maybe it's going to become like the outside world and no good anymore. And I said, no, no, you got your same list of people who are going to do trading. The fact that outsiders can send you stuff too can only enhance. It can't hurt your system. So that was a major problem, making them convinced that having a worldwide system would not endanger the local oneness of what it does for their surroundings. So... Uh, of course, the ideals may run up against less seductive realities. These currencies aren't immune from counterfeiters. Well, they could be. As is already the case in Argentina, misappropriations of funds by managers, well, that's theft. You bust them of the account unit for other excesses. But most of all, all relations between alternative money and the state guaranteeing the official money may be tense. Because exchanges in creditos or in ardoise don't fit easily into taxation or other social charges. Well, actually, they do. In Canada, you simply have to pay taxes on earnings that were done if it was part of your profession. Otherwise, not. But they make you pay in cash, not creditos, and they should allow you to pay in creditos too. So, in France, members of Celle de Foi à Liège had thusly been found guilty of clandestine employment. Oh, my God, they helped themselves in clandestine before they went in their case on appeal. So, anyway, uh, now, there are two easy things that can be done to safeguard against counterfeiting, like they do at Friendly Favors, where each member's picture is printed on the currency check. In the Mexico City, Tlaloc notes there are lines on the backs of the checks for third party, fourth, fifth, sixth, all the way up to 10 extra endorsement on the notes. The person signs the check made out to the worker. The worker is the first endorsement on the back. That person's the third endorsement on the back. Too many signatures to be an easy fraud. Cohabitation. In the long run, these systems are not viable if they come into competition with the national currency, opines Jerome Blanc, economist. Well, yeah, it's true. Men have been stupid enough to be lured off their stable lifeboats 
onto sinking ships by the promise of a little bit of usury, getting something for nothing. And you can always sucker them into the trap again by promising them something for nothing. Everyone's always looking for a free ride. They've been conditioned to be that way. And yes, they're on their stable credito system and everybody's surviving. But the moment the government offers them some federal cash with a little bit of interest, because you can put it in the banks now, they always switch back. Isn't that sad? Isn't that testament to the stupidity of humans? So, it's the case if they're simply a palliative to a catastroph catastrophic situation and reproduce the characteristics of official money, notably inflation. All right, well, here's an economist who doesn't understand that when you run money like poker chips without interest, you can't have inflation because the chips are backed up by the collateral. But, of course, you'll never be able to explain to an economist why there's no inflation. Which is the case for the dominant money in Argentina? Jerome Blanc argues rather for a cohabitation between the two currencies, the parallel and the official, national for international trade. In Argentina, where the peso is worth for the moment nothing anymore, the credito has received the support of some authorities, much like many municipalities support their lessons in England. To be realistic, he advocates cohabitation between the system, but the old system will die. Well, I say economist Jerome Blatt tells us that this system isn't viable if it competes with national currency, but in Argentina, the national currency only represents 20% of the money in circulation, so this system has already won the competition. Oh, of course, of course, as soon as the federal money becomes available more plentifully, they'll switch back. Yeah, he's right. And the only government support needed is for them to accept creditos in payment of taxes, and their system would have been fixed forever. So thanks to the politicians who refused to accept creditos and taxes, they managed to put off the salvation of their nations a little longer. So here's an article from Liberation, and it's the editorial, and it's called Survival by Jacques Amalric. August 22nd, 2002 still. Liberate man by abolishing the alienating link of money and to each according to his needs. Utopia doesn't date since yesterday, and it's going strong. But it is never reborn as vigorously as when the financial debacles turn it into an evident necessity, a way to survive. That's how it was during, and on the very next day, of the Soviet collapse. In those years when the ruble wasn't even worth the weight of the paper it was printed on, only barter permitted the most deprived to survive. But it is a savage barter where the weakest were despoiled by those meaner and needier of veritable but temporarily useless riches in exchange for food and clothing. Truck for the profit of the worst bandits who today have instituted themselves into robber barons. Therein lies no doubt the great difference with the phenomenon that makes like an oily spot on Argentina since the kingdom of the tango was sunk in a crash. Barter, yes, but barter thought out, organized, controlled so that thanks to several networks created for the occasions, millions of Argentinians who were threatened with indigence by the paralysis of the economy, the evaporation of the value of the peso, and the de facto confiscation of their economies have created a parallel economy of fortune that lets them keep their heads above water. A success of the new social radicality affirms the more political of the promoters of the initiative, for which the erosion of a state has shown itself totally incompetent and incapable of resisting the poisoned recipes of the IMF and financial speculation is not necessarily a bad thing, certainly. However, we don't quite see how to draw the durable lessons from the Argentine experience. First, because it looks like it has hit its limits. The more it extends to all of society, the more it is menaced by the con men who have transformed themselves into counterfeiters. Social money without which the stock stays limited to a few phalansters. And of course, if it was all done online, all large transactions, there could be no counterfeiting, right? Credit my account, debit his account, how can you counterfeit? And of course, where are the counterfeiters going to put the stuff they get? 